For our first keynote of the day, we're going to be joined by Brian Sivak, Chief Technology Officer of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Brian joined HHS as Chief Technology Officer in July 2011. In this role, he's responsible for helping HHS leadership harness the power of data, technology, and innovation to improve the health and welfare of the nation. Previously, Brian served as the Chief Innovation Officer to Maryland Governor Martin O'Malley, where, he's led, uh, Mer where he led Maryland's efforts to embed concepts of innovation into the DNA of state government. He's distinguished himself in this role as someone who can create, cre who can work creatively across a large government organization to identify and implement the best practices for improving the way government works. Let me also say that Brian's passion and action in this area of open health data has all has has been incredibly powerful and inspiring to the Health Data Consortium itself and to me personally. His involvement and his support of the Health Data Consortium has been enormous. Uh, I'm proud to also call Brian a friend. We at HDC, and I personally am honored to call him a brother in arms in this effort. Brian, let me welcome you to the stage. All right. Good morning, everybody. What are you guys saying? Is this working? You can hear me okay? Awesome. So uh, I thought I would start today with a quick story. Um, and there are these two guys in New York. Uh, who are working to disrupt healthcare as we know it today, one aspect of it. Uh, their names are Mike Galvo and Russ Graney. Some of you guys might know them or might have heard of them. And they started a small company a while back called Aiden. Now, Aiden, to me, is a pretty interesting story. Uh, these two guys had a, uh, a very personal experience, a very similar personal experience, in that loved ones, family members, had to go into the hospital uh, for some procedures, and as a result, needed to uh, go to post-acute care facilities when they were done. Now, when the uh, family member, when their family members checked out of the hospital, they were discharged. They were handed by the discharge planner a, a photocopied sheet of paper that literally had 30 names of post-acute care facilities on it, with addresses and phone numbers. And so, Mike and Russ separately uh, both did what any rational actor would do at that point and said, which one is closest to our house? Because we're going to have to go back and forth and we want it to be as easy and convenient as possible. So they picked the most geographically proximate, convenient location to send their loved ones to for post-acute care. In both of their cases, that turned out to not be a great decision. Now, luckily, nothing happened to their loved ones that was significant, but they both experienced uh, some relatively negative phenomenon that were actually well-known and documented. There were all kinds of issues with over-medication in one of the places, other issues in the other place. And if they had had that information, they probably would have made different decisions. Now, both of them then realized that this information was available, some of it available through the federal government, some of it available from other sources. And so they started a company called Aiden, which is attempting to assist both discharge planners and hospitals, and also uh, family members, caregivers, et cetera, to help people make the right decisions for post-acute care, okay? So it's a great story. Uh, totally disruptive in a lot of ways in a particular aspect of the healthcare ecosystem. But my favorite part about this is that before they started this company, neither Mike nor Russ knew anything at all about healthcare, okay? They just had a personal experience. They recognized an issue. They recognized that there was information out there to solve their problem and went out and fixed it. And to me, this is a trend that I've sort of been fascinated by for a long time. Uh, I, if you look across the, sort of the, the spectrum of history, one of the things you see is that people who have the potential or who actually do disrupt industries uh, tend to be outsiders to those industries. If you uh, ask Mike and Russ, or if you ask um, David Friedberg from the Climate Corporation, or maybe even uh, Nicholas Zenstrom and Janice Fries from Skype, or maybe even Jeff Bezos at Amazon, if they knew the things today about the industries that they have disrupted back when they started it, would they have started those companies? The answer, in some of those cases, for sure, because I've talked to these folks, is no. It's, you know, it's, you don't know what you don't know until you get into it. And so the fact that this is happening in healthcare, a $2.8 trillion industry in this country, 18% uh, of our GDP, uh, is nothing but encouraging to me. Now, at HHS, I actually have two titles. Uh, one is the Chief Technology Officer, as Dwayne mentioned. Uh, the other title is Entrepreneur in Residence. And in a lot of ways, uh, that's the title that I actually focus on a lot more. Um, I am a technologist by training. I actually got a computer science degree at the University of Chicago right down the street. 
Uh, I am a huge geek at heart. I love this stuff, right? But one of the things that I've come to realize over time is that technology isn't usually, if ever, a solution to the deep problems. Technology can be an enabler, it can be a catalyst, it can be an accelerant, but the thing that changes these environments and these ecosystems are cultural things, right? They're, they're typically uh, changes to the culture and environment, changes to a process. And so um, that's one of the reasons that I focus on this EIR, EIR role at HHS more, because I feel like within that context, we actually have the potential to make a much more significant change across the entire ecosystem. Now, my role at HHS is really to help uh, both our, our, our 90,000 people that work at the department and the leaders of the department uh, really improve on the way that we actively are trying to transform the delivery of um, uh, health care, uh, changing public health, the delivery of human services for the American people. And as a result, one of the things that we are actively focusing on is looking for these disruptors, looking for people like Mike and Russ, probably many of you in this room, that have the power to actually do this. And why? Well, because right now, uh, healthcare is literally undergoing what I think a lot of you in this room would agree is the most dramatic transformation uh, since the creation of Medicare and Medicaid in 1965. So, in the past three years in particular, have been you know this really interesting state of flux I think for the, the ecosystem, uh, really set in motion by the passage of the Affordable Care Act in 2010. And because of this, we're, we're not living in a system anymore where 20% of your insurance premiums are going to go to administrative costs instead of going to actually uh, paying for direct health care. Uh, we're not living in a system anymore where uh, preventative care, uh, vaccinations, um, uh, breast cancer screening, things like that, aren't a part of a person's overall health care. Uh, but we are living in an ecosystem and in an age where data is driving change. Data is fueling things like payment reform. Uh, it's the, it's the, the missing ingredient to help us understand how we go from a system where we pay uh, for the where we pay for right now the quantity of procedures and move to a system where we actually pay for the quality of care that people receive. Data is changing how people actually interact uh, <clears throat> with their own health and manage their own health. Um, Changing it from a, a mode where people really only inter interacted with their own health when they got sick, uh, and moving it more towards a mode where you interact with it on a daily basis. How many, out of curiosity, how many people in this room actively carry uh, at least one uh, sort of personal fitness device, like a Fitbit or something like that? Pretty good number of you. And I would suspect that many of you carry more than one. I actually have three on me at any one time. <laughs> That's another story for another time. Um, so, so that's one, another area where data is changing. Data, data is changing where the way that physicians actually provide care, uh, from integrated data that's generated by these personal devices, uh, and and actually there are a lot of physicians out there who are now using predictive analytics to start treating people in different ways. Um, <clears throat> there was a report from McKinsey in 2011, which I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, they identified the value of data in healthcare as having the potential to remove billions of dollars in costs from the system and at the same time significantly increase the quality of care. And this was a pretty robust study. So, so we at the department, we, we actually see this exact same value. Uh, and, and it's clear to us, data is a huge part of the future of healthcare in this country. In fact, I think it's probably the, the key ingredient to making this system change. So the question is, what are we doing about it? Well, for the last three years, as many of you know, we've made uh, essentially a cultivation of the, the, the health data ecosystem, a massive priority at the department. Um, and that movement we've called the Health Data Initiative. Actually, my colleague Damon Davis sitting over there, raise your hand, Damon. Uh, he is the director of the Health Data, the health data Initiative. And, and this movement uh, has three main goals. Number one, the goal is to make health data as openly available as possible. Number two, to disseminate that data as broadly as possible across the ecosystem. And then number three, to continuously educate both internal and external people as to the power that this data has to actually change the way things work. Now, so to, to, to put a cornerstone, if you will, on the work of the last few years and also to provide a path forward, um, we actually just released something that I'm personally pretty proud of and, and Damon spent a long time working on, which is, I think, and I could be wrong about this, but I, I think this is accurate. I, I think it's the first real uh, what I'm calling an execution plan for 
keep meet, meeting open data goals, uh, specifically in healthcare, but I actually think it's the first one across any open data initiative. Uh, and we just released this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you can find it on our blog at healthdata.gov. Uh, but the plan is interesting because uh, if any of you, for those of you here who know me, uh, you'll, you'll recognize this immediately. For those of you who don't, uh, you'll learn something about me, which is that I love metrics and measurement and you know, milestones and, and things like that. And the neat thing about this plan is that it is a uh, set of time-bound, milestone-based deliverables that uh, stretch out over the next couple of years that are designed to ensure that we, we actually reach the goals that we've set for ourselves in terms of making data both available and, more importantly, useful in this ecosystem. So the plan has five main goals. Number one, advancing the healthdata.gov website to be something that's more efficient, more user-friendly, uh, more technically advanced, but in general, more usable for the, the people who need to use that site to get data out of it to uh, uh, provide comments back to us, to host discussions, things like that. Second, we want to highlight departmental assets that support uh, achieving the strategic initiatives that the department has set for itself. And this is a, a set of strategic initiatives that exists at the secretarial level. So we want to make sure that all of the data assets that we have can be uh, focused on achieving those strategic goals. And also, uh, at the same time, an increased focus on what we're calling strategic data liberation. So we have lots and lots and lots of data sets out there. Uh, some of them are, let's just say, less useful than others. We want to make sure that we're prioritizing the ones that are more useful to, to the community than the ones that are less useful. Uh, third, we want to educate people, uh, new and existing, internal and external folks, uh, in this ecosystem uh, about the availability of data uh, about the innovative applications that can or should be created, uh, and really work on disseminating that data as broadly as we can for problem solving. Fourth, we want to enable and incentivize the health data ecosystem so that they can utilize all of the assets that we have in a much more effective way. And then finally, we want to uh, implement and, and define internal administration and departmental policies that will foster this idea of openness and transparency and, and the utility of data for internal uh, use cases. We feel that if we can codify these things uh, through official policy, then you know once this administration is gone, because all, all things have to come to an end, at least this will have a pathway and a plan to it. So everything that I'm going to talk about today uh, really leads back to those five main goals. Now, the first step in achieving our mission is obviously making the data that we have available for public use in the first place. And so for the last few years, as I said, we focused primarily on liberating all of this data, uh, basically anything we could find. And we started with a pile of 30 data sets on a table in 2010. Uh, we're now at a point where we have over 1,000 data sets in the department that are cataloged on healthdata.gov. And I think that what you can see as a result of this is that we have successfully changed for the most part, the default setting within the department from sort of closed, where I don't give you any data, to open, where they ask, how can I give you my data? And that is an important switch to flip in government. For any of you guys who have interacted with or worked in government in the past, uh, you'll understand that that's a, a challenge sometimes to get people to think about this stuff from an open perspective as opposed to a closed perspective. So the fact that we're there, I think, is a massive shift. Um, I'll give you a good example of this. Uh, some of you guys, in fact, many of you probably remember earlier this year, CMS released uh, a bunch of data about uh, uh, charge data for the most common inpatient and outpatient procedures. Uh, basically released it um, uh, for the whole country in uh, specific, with specific hospitals listed. And there were some really interesting visualizations done. Uh, what was most interesting to me is that uh, when we released that data set, within the first couple of weeks it was downloaded over 200,000 times from people all over the world, which is kind of fascinating for a Medicare cost data set, right? Um, and actually, I think maybe one of my proudest moments uh, was that, and this actually, I was proud for CMS because they're the ones who did the work to release it, but, but it was actually featured positive on The Daily Show. Right? And how often, I mean, seriously, how often does John Stewart talk positive about government? It's like the best clip ever. So, you know, I kind of feel, I, I kind of feel like, you know, at that moment we, we could just hang up our spurs and grenade it, right? Um, but actually, even better than that, um, that, Daily Show, that Daily Show clip was, um, I was talking to my boss, the Deputy Secretary of the Department, a couple of weeks after we released that data set, and I told him the statistics of how many people had downloaded it. 
And he looked at me and he said, that's great, Brian. What are we doing next? And I thought, that's awesome, right? The Deputy Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services is not satisfied with the fact that we just have this, this like, kind of geeky data set go viral, but he wants to know what we're doing next. Like, what other data can we release? That is a, a sea change in the way that, that we think about things. And actually, it's a very useful tool for me when I wander around the department, because I can use that statement and say, look, Big Boss wants it. What are we going to do? So uh, we're never ones to pass up an opportunity like that. So we are running with it. Um, additionally to liberating data over the past few years, one of the things we've talked a lot about is entrepreneurs and developers and how they can take advantage of this data that we've released. But it turns out that it's not just entrepreneurs and developers who can uh, take advantage of this data. It's actually patients as well. And so um, one of the things that we're working quite closely with our colleagues in uh, uh, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT in CMS and also in the VA where there's this idea of liberating patient data through this thing called Blue Button Plus. How many of you guys have heard of Blue Button Plus? Excellent. So the cool thing about this, you know, I speak at a bunch of different things. And, uh, whenever I get on the Blue Button, I always ask how many people have, have heard about this. And I can tell you that the number of hands that go up is increasing, which is a very, very, very good sign. Uh, it used to be the case that literally three people would raise their hand at the very beginning. So it's, it's cool that this word is spreading. Um, for those of you who, who aren't familiar with this, basically um, HIPAA regs were recently clarified to essentially give patients the right to an electronic copy of their data. Uh, and also through a program called Meaningful Use, um, this fall and winter, patients uh, across the country are going to be able to what's called view, download, and transmit, or VDT, uh, the data that's contained in, in their uh, provider's electronic health record if that EHR so, um, is certified to comply with meaningful use regs. Um, what's cool about that is that there's this growing ecosystem now um, of patient-facing applications and tools that's starting to use this information to uh, help patients do interesting things. And if you think about it, it's sort of an interesting chicken and egg problem, right? There are all these potentially cool use cases for patient data, but until that data is made available, it's hard to imagine a developer saying, I'm going to build something to actually utilize that data. So we're starting to see the data holders start to, to blue button plus enable their applications. Uh, the VA is like this close to doing it. Um, CMS, um, well, they're a little distracted right now. But once they get undistracted, they're going to get right back in. Uh, and that's all I'll say about that. Um, uh, but, but, uh, but there is a lot of stuff happening. And, and some examples of use cases that I think would be pretty cool, uh, and that we've talked a little bit about internally to enable. Um, enable patients to reconcile errors in their health record. How many times have you guys seen uh, an explanation of benefits for yourselves that had wrong data? I mean, almost everyone I've looked at has wrong data. Right? Um, second, how many of you guys have kids? How many of you guys have to deal with your kids' vaccination records with camps and schools and it's a huge pain in the ass? Right. So what if we do blue button enable vaccination records? Just send them electronically. Um, or third, you know, think about that explanation of benefits again. It's a very generally speaking, vague and sort of hard document to decipher. What if we could automatically uh, or programmatically decipher those documents in interesting ways? Right? These are three really simple but incredibly useful use cases that Blue Button Plus can and should enable relatively quickly. And honestly, there are millions more. This is where the power and the creativity of the developer world, I think, really comes into play. Right? Because once the data is made available, people are going to start to say, oh, yeah. I have this use case. Let's just do this thing. And, and that stuff is what I'm looking forward to. Now, if that sounds great, but you don't have any experience with Blue Button, that's OK, too. Because one of the things that we're doing uh, are holding these regular live and virtual uh, develop developer forums across the country uh, in order to um, uh, build a community around the idea and to start to teach people about the protocol and the things that are possible. So this is part of the education piece. Um, we also want to make it easy for consumers, uh, patients, to actually find and use their data. So this January, uh, we're going to be launching in conjunction with ONC something called the Blue Button Connector, which is going to make it very, very clear uh, what type of data that patients can access through their providers, uh, but also highlight applications that are Blue Button enabled so that people know actually what they can go and do, what they can download, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, one of the things I would say, if you guys are using Blue Button in any way, or if you plan on using Blue Button in any way, definitely let us know, because we're always looking for new examples that we can add to the site, or things that I can frankly talk about, because I love talking about stuff that's actually happening. 
uh, if you want me to do a demo of your stuff, like I can do that. You know, it's it's a good it's a good outlet for these things. So let us know if you have an application, if you're doing it, if you're thinking about it, and we can talk about it. Uh, another thing that we're working on is making CMS data much more effective um, and also easier to work with. Um, if any of you guys have ever tried to get access to Medicare data, uh, you know that it's a relatively expensive, onerous, challenging process. Uh, we know this, and we are working very, very closely with CMS to try to make this easier. Uh, in fact, I mean, if you get CMS data, we actually have to ship it to you on physical hard drives sometimes. It's crazy. Um, but one of the things that we're doing is, um, first of all, um, making more CMS data sets available in easier ways. A good example is going to be a physician level uh, Medicare charge and quality measures database. That was, you guys might have seen that Florida court case that was preventing us from releasing that for literally decades. Now that that's been removed, we have the ability to actually do this. And so early in 2014, we expect to start releasing some of that data, which is going to be very interesting. Um, and then in 2014, we're also uh, looking at ways that we can add CMS claims data to external data enclaves so that you can actually go to a external data enclave, hopefully, and play with CMS data along with a bunch of other data sets. Uh, it's a little challenging for obvious reasons, but if we can get there, I think we can uh, accelerate some of this stuff and do massively. Um, another thing that we're doing. Um, and, and this is something that I think is kind of interesting, especially for people who are building applications, developers out there, uh, is that we're working to sort of encourage and enable the disruptors out here uh, by helping them scale. Uh, so my, before I started in the government, I started a couple of software companies, enterprise software companies. And one of the uh, one of the most difficult things about this was getting your first customer. Right? You know, you can build an application, you build this thing, but getting the first guy to sign on the dotted line to even pilot something is a challenge. Uh, but once you have that foothold, once you've got a pilot, once you've got data being generated, it's a lot easier to take that next step and to kind of leverage that success into something else. And so one of the things that I think is really important is trying to help innovative small companies who maybe are not the best at actually selling stuff to help get their applications or their services in use somewhere to see if it's actually a valuable resource. And so one of the things that we're working with is, uh, or we're working to do is working with uh, a couple of care delivery uh, systems, uh, a couple of provider networks, to hopefully provide a test bed for some new applications that exist out there. If we can give you guys a pathway for actually developing an application and then rolling that into a potential customer, or at least a live site where you can generate data, that's pretty cool. And that would actually hopefully give uh, a much quicker on ramp to, to the sort of road that you're trying to go down. Um, so I'm going to get um, okay, so I'm, I'm close to the end. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay, so so I have basically just mentioned a whole bunch of places that uh, everybody here can plug into uh, with the stuff that we're doing. Uh, but in case you want some more ideas, in case you need you need something more than an open invitation, um, I'm going to give you a few things in particular that I think would be interesting for everybody here to think about. So first of all. Um, is there a data set out there that you know we have that you want to use? If so, tell us, and we will go and get it. Uh, that's where the prioritization of these strategically relevant data assets comes into play. Uh, we can prioritize what we think are the most important, but uh, it's much, much more helpful if the people who actually want to do interesting things with that data tell us which ones are the most important. Um, Secondly, it's not just HHS data that we're looking for. Uh, the neat thing about healthdata.gov is that it's growing into a central repository for any and all pieces of health data, not just HHS health data. Um, we recently added the state of New York's data to this data repository. Uh, as you just heard, the state of Illinois is setting up their own data repository, and we're actually looking at adding that data to it as well. In fact, Seven states, uh, the most recent as of, uh, what, this morning, came. Literally this morning, Maryland agreed to send us their health data. So this is pretty cool. Healthdata.gov is actually turning into a, uh, a completely <coughs> comprehensive centralized platform for all health data across the country. And actually, we are in the process of talking to some of our counterparts at the NHS in the UK right now. And hopefully, we're going to be adding some data from the UK as well. So think about this. This can kind of be a really, really interesting resource for, for data. Um, and then finally, and maybe in some ways most importantly, we really need to know what people are working 
Uh, we can see from statistics on the website what data sets people are accessing and what kind of links they're clicking through on, but that doesn't help us figure out how that data is getting used and applications that are being hooked with it. And without that, it's hard for us to talk about all the cool use cases and all the problems that are being solved. So uh, this might be the most important ask, but for any of you guys out there who are working on some of these things, definitely let us know what you're working on. Tell us where the data is being used. Tell us what value you're getting out of it. And uh, we will figure out ways to make sure that we can highlight some of these use cases. Because for us, the examples are what actually drive these things forward. Um, with that, uh, I want to thank you guys very, very much. I, I ran over my time a little bit. I'm sorry. But uh, this has been great. And uh, I look forward to talking to you guys uh, specifically in the future. Thanks. <laughs> So let me thank uh, let me thank again Crystal Thomas, Dr. Hausman, Brian Sivak uh, for their continued leadership.